ahead and get started. Uh, I'm really excited by this talk. Uh, because as I've gotten older, I've realized what I am trying to do is art as well as technology. And that we, in fact, we are all artists. And uh, what we're going to see today, I think, is incredibly beautiful as well as technologically very interesting. Another thing is, as I stand here right now, I realize there is a split between the engineers and the artists. And it shows up in this room. No one has sat in the middle chairs. Clearly, everyone <laughs> over here is left <laughs> and everyone over here is right brain. But I, I can never keep it straight. Maybe you're the right brain ones and you're the left brain ones. In any event, I, I was told to remind you we're having a party when this is over, post seminar reception. And then there's another party, uh, the School for Computer Science Talent and Arts show in Gates and Fort Moore at, I forgot to write down, 6 o'clock. So at least two parties. There's an after party. If you're really cool, you'll get invited. And uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, Lenny Yao is going to tell us about Morphe Matter Lab. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, and uh, so Chris asked if I needed to meditate beforehand. I said I felt at home because my lab is literally on the third floor at the corner <laughs> between uh, New Assembly Hall and the uh, gates, basically it's like right after the bridge. Uh, you guys are all welcome to come to our lab and chat more or visit. So I started my research uh, lab and also my um, position at Human Computer Interaction Institute in 2017. It was my great, great honor to actually be able to stand here and share with you guys some of uh, some of my work I've been really wanting to collaborate more with Robotic Institute professors and students for quite a while as well um, so so today I'm gonna focus on like a few um, projects um, that are done in our lab some are recent some are actually um, uh, two years old so I start my story with the pine tree so I'm not sure if you guys ever had the experience of picking up a pine cone from the, from the wild, but uh, basically when you, um, when you pick them up after rain, so uh, the, the scales of the pine cone are closed. But uh, once you leave it on a balcony for a couple of uh, days, uh, the uh, scales will open up. Uh, and the magical part is if you put it back in water, it will close again. Um, this part, this, this pine cone really inspired me even when I was a little kid. Uh, I grew up in Inner Mongolia. So later on, I read some science papers after I got uh, into my PhD and realized this is actually one of the types of smart uh, actuators you can discover in nature. Or a lot of scientists are really amazed by, by, uh, by those phenomena. So it ranges from very simple bending motion, uh, that's the pine cone, to complicated uh, coiling motion, to you know, a combination of mechanical buckling and uh, bending. And uh, for what purpose? Actually for survival. So nature developed this interesting motion mechanism for the sake of dispersing their seeds for most of the time. Um, and uh, if you look at this erodium ore, actually it's a very smart seed that will drill itself into the ground when the rain comes. It's a desert seed mechanism. If you think about it, they're kind of like a robotic, robotic seed or robotic natural plants in a sense. So in, uh, in our lab, we basically do a lot of nature-inspired material development. We sometimes look at those uh, organisms under different scales of microscopes uh, and trying to engineer the equivalent of the natural system, uh, equivalent of the artificial system. And sometimes we also try to directly extract and reuse the natural material. And along the way, because we want to design system, we're ultimately uh, boiled down to the words of being makers. Uh, so we do uh, engineer machines and trying to think about computational software tools to help us better design systems as well. And uh, we are also designers. So in my team, there are actually industrial designers who are very interested in thinking, um, uh, thinking about um, applications for those robotic material behaviors. Um, and uh, we uh, have nothing against robots, but <laughs> most of the applications we did are actually beyond just robots, the robo uh, robots in, I guess, in a normal sense. Um, 
So that's um, natural morphing matter. So we defined a few properties for natural morphing matter. As you can imagine, uh, if we extract the spirit of the pine cone, it's usually responsive, transformative, and adaptive. However, it's electricity free. Unlike our electromagnetic system, often are widely adapted in robot in robots design. And also, uh, there are computation, but we often do not uh, really rely on microcontrollers to do all the computation. The compositions of the material through different hierarchical scales um, itself is computation, is structural computation. Sometimes soft roboticists would call this uh, morphological computation or mechanical computation. So we are trying to leverage uh, different uh, uh, widely accessible materials to engineer transformation behaviors as well. So I wanted to uh, bring up a few of them today, uh, meaning chairs, paper, food, and fabric. Um, and uh, I'll start with the self-assembly furniture. To, try to convince you guys furniture can be considered as uh, some sort of a robot as well. So we have been really envisioning a automatic pipeline to get what you want as the shape of the furniture, um, as a input to our smart software. And uh, then we're going to have a tool to kind of flatten whatever you want in 3D into 2D sheets and 3D print them out and then have those 2D sheets shipped back to your home, and then have all those sheets be triggered and self-assembled <coughs> into the 3D shape that you, you initially inputted into the software uh, for a while. So this is like a, a big dream. I mean, it was partially inspired by IKEA. If you think about IKEA furniture, so they save millions of dollars by making all the panels flat and let it shape home <coughs> flat packed. Um, but once they are at your home, you have to spend a lot of time to assemble it. So we were thinking how you can make uh, you know, a self-assembly material to save your uh, um, assembling effort, basically. So this was a little toy chair that uh, we printed basically was a flat uh, sheet that can transform into a, share, a chair shape. Um, this was reversely engineered by, um, by talented designers in our team. However, how can you uh, computationally control the behavior? What if now we wanted to have any arbitrary shapes for your, for your chair that, uh, that you are inputting? So we started looking into uh, um, 3D printable shape memory thermoplastic, and we are trying to also quantify the behavior of those thermoplastic, meaning we, we wanted to find a way to 3D print hinges with programmable bending curvature. Then from there, you can, you can integrate some uh, inverse design method that comes from a uh, uh, graphic world. So basically, you can imagine you input an arbitrary 3D shape, in this case, a Stanford bunny, and you get um, a simplified in its meshed form. And then we can consider it as an origami. Then we can flatten the origami piece and convert it into a 3D printed two path um, with the final sheets printed and triggered to uh, to make it back into a bunny shape. So this is the software. So you can see, again, so the bunny got, got interpreted, all the folding angles got computed, and then the flat pattern got turned into printed three, uh, printing 3D, uh, printing two path. And then with the flat sheets, you can, uh, you can trigger it to have it self-assemble. So there's only a bit of a smart thing we did beyond existing um, uh, inverse origami uh, flattening algorithm, we did convert the sharp folding into a curved fo folding because uh, for material, um, for this shape memory thermoplasty, we actually need a certain uh, space for it to fold into the right angle, unlike the normal paper origami folding. So why, why we are interested in developing those tools? Because a, uh, there are shapes we wanted to self-assemble uh, are kind of beyond our imagination so, uh, and very hard to calculate if we just try to use our uh, labor-intensive brains. Uh, so for example, if you are trying to get this rose self-assembled from a flat disk, these are the, many, the, the numbers of layers you need to integrate into your printing process. Um, and uh, with the software, just one click, but uh, yeah, it's getting harder for us to really imagine. And also just to mention, the rows, if you wanted to use uh, conventional um, FDM printing to achieve, it takes eight hours. 
so the but for our uh, our method it only take uh, one hour and 12 minutes and uh, you know then there's uh, uh, no uh, post assembly efforts at all so then, but we were not so happy with just origami shapes. Origamis are easy computationally, um, but uh, there are only limited shapes you can achieve. And most of the shapes are not ideal for furniture design because they are, they often have some sort of sharp hinges. So we wanted to create those double curvature surfaces that are smooth, more organic, more impressive. And uh, this basically requires us to think about more advanced computational inverse design algorithms. So for example, the chair on the right, on the right hand side uh, basically are also trigger to self-assemble from a flat piece. Um, but in order to trigger it to this final shape, we can inversely compute um, how much shrinkage uh, ratio um, uh, is needed for each beam. Um, and eventually that led us to design um, more of a generalized method to think about a network of beam and use the network of beams to think about self-assembly. So we developed both shrinkage-based actuator and also bending-based actuator for each beam element and you can use different algorithms to uh, inversely design the flat uh, pattern uh, leveraging both actuator so for bending actuator you can actually uh, sorry for shrinkage actuator you can um, you can basically use the conformal mapping method to inversely compute what is the shrinkage ratio needed for each beam. And for bending based actuator, you can use a Chebyshev net algorithm to back calculate what is the bending angle needed for each beam. Uh, with that, you can start to think about a lot of uh, complex geometry that can be considered as input and have all the flat pattern um, being computed as the output. So these are more examples. You can tell they are some are uh, like helmet and some are chairs and even armors. Um, and this is a small video to just show the whole pipeline of um, designing those self-assembly uh, mesh networks. So you have a given input in 3D um, and then the software will help to compute the flat geometry of it and also uh, generate the printing tool path. So this specific example, we are actually trying to develop a lampshade. So it's a flat panel, as you can see, printed. Um, and uh, once you put it in hot water, it will um, pops up into the shape that we wanted or the shape we inputted into our software at the beginning. And uh, you can do, you can control the curvature um, uh, to have both um, positive and uh, negative Gaussian curvatures as well. So this is a foot plate. Uh, again, it was printed flat, but uh, with some heat, you can trigger it to form this organic shape. And this is another panel printed flat. This is slightly larger. Actually, it took us about four or five hours to print. Uh, in our lab, we have a gigantic <laughs> FDM printer. You can print very large objects. And you can print a hard armor piece that fits perfectly to your body. And this is a classic chair uh, designed by a Japanese designer. So we were just trying to see how far we can push in terms of the uh, organic shapes of a chair. So this is a smaller version of the chair. Um, and this is a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio of a real chair. So me sitting on it. Not everybody can sit on it as of now, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, we are improving it. We actually have an ongoing project trying to print carbon and glass fiber composite um, that can self-fold into 3D. Mm. And Honda is collaborating with us because they're interested in integrating this self-assembly process for the fast, prototy fast, fast prototyping of their car parts. So if the designers are thinking of prototyping some organic shapes, uh, they can do this faster with our method. So then we are, this is uh, the final push of where we are now in terms of designing smart chairs. Uh, we gradually figured maybe it's a stupid idea to think about printing everything uh, out of a 3D print 
printer because it's so slow, you can just you know CNC cut some big wood panels. However, leveraging the smart mechanism to think about self-assembly of their legs and components could be interesting. So we started to think about the idea of computational joints. In this case, all the legs they can be flat packed again, but uh, then once at home, you can just poke them through holes and use a hair dryer to let it bend and self-lock into place. So that's smart, but then we have to look into a different dimension. Instead of a 2D sheets that can be triggered, we have to think about a 1D line that can be triggered. So here we just show is another method to think about a line as voxelized components and can have a programmable transformation behavior. So for example, if you try to design a rows, you can start with a single line in the software. You can compute and simulate how the line will, will, will bend in 3D space, and then the software we will eventually get uh, get a few lines out of uh, uh, out uh, into the printer. So this is again, it's a single line. But if you look at the cross section, they are carefully designed with the special co combinations of voxels, and each has a desired uh, shrinkage ratio and also shrinkage direction. And uh, if you go yeah crazier to think about combinations of each section, then you can really start to design a line that can self-morph into arbitrary 3D shapes. So this was the rows that uh, we designed in the software. Um, and it came out as a single line out of a printer. But once you put it in water, it can self-fold back into a rose. Um, and uh, I'm very excited about this direction because uh, it opens up new space rather than just flat pack uh, borrowed from uh, IKEA. Imagine you can have a very, very thin line that tra travel through very narrow spaces. For example, inside your body, you can, you can let a smart drug travel through your body and then self-deploy in a 3D form to speed up or slow down the drug delivery or even to monitor your health. So we actually had a uh, short conversation with bioengineering department here to think about a biocompatible version of a transforming line. Um, yeah, so this is just to show you can parametrically design shapes and start to quantify and test out how shapes can be associated with different functions as well. We're just trying to design a vase in this case, but you can parametrically design many vases. Um, and uh, this might be interesting to mechanical engineering um, folks too. So you can design compliant mechanism. Uh, you can imagine those things will be very hard to 3D print, uh, use normal supporting material kind of way. And uh, the surface quality are not going to be as good uh, either. But you can, by morphing lines, to create those compliant mechanisms much more easily and faster as well. And fun things. You can make a frog with a bouncing leg by, uh, uh, by 4D morphing the uh, legs as well. So here you can have the spring behavior. You can go quite geeky about the springs. You can do variable spring design in terms of the diameters and also the pitch and even some of the mechanical performance. You can tune it through the way you design it in the software. Yeah, so this was the self-assembled chair example I just said. Um, I, as we are pushing further and further of this whole self-assembly idea, we started to realize um, there are a lot of challenges in terms of fast and accurate simulation. Um, because you can imagine, these are shape memory thermoplastic, and there are phase transitions um, during the trigger. So they are stiff with their coat, but once you are putting them in hot water, they started to pass uh, over their glass transition temperature and become rubbery. And then there are more, um, more variables here, gravitational and torsional forces between each mesh elements, etc. So we started to look into how we can leverage both graphic method as well as you know, those conventional numeric simulations, such as um, um, the, some of those as FEA methods, but to, but to combine them together with uh, some uh, interesting machine learning algorithm to think about faster and uh, more intuitive simulation. So we basically, it's very simple, straightforward. So we, we uh, simulated a lot of those mesh structure uh, in a much slower numeric simulation environment. And then using different machine learning algorithms, particularly we're looking into graphic convolutional network to train the, mo the data, the model we are, we, we are gaining from the uh, finite element um, analysis. And now we can basically do much faster simulation and with much better um, accuracy. And uh, we care about it as a 2D 
designer because we really want uh, everybody to be able to use the tool very fast uh, and do real time, see real time feedback um, on the flight. So just to share the vision of this whole effort a little bit, we do think uh, with 4D printing of self-assembly structure, we are bringing manufacturer into a better ecosystem because we are using um, you know, uh, sustainable materials. We get to 3D print things much, much faster and we get to ship things flat to save space and effort. And then we also get to save your assembly method. So it is just interesting in terms of the whole, uh, the, the impact of it for the whole pipeline. And uh, just to mention, because perhaps people sitting down here are more roboticists. So most of the algorithms we designed are based on shape memory thermoplastic. Apparently, they're one time. They're self-assembly. They're not robots. But uh, you can imagine if you change this thermoplastic into another reversible uh, actuatable material, then all the algorithms can be leveraged. We can, for example, think about designing a robot that's just a bunch of uh, network of mesh. But we'll be able to take in whatever shape you want as the given shape, and then whatever the shape you want as the potential transformed shape, basically. And then we can um, uh, instruct how you want to design the mesh uh, actuators with how many of, uh, how much of a shrinkage ratio. So basically, you can use it for soft robots as well, as long as you started to change to a material that can reversely, reversely actuate. That's actually one of the thing we've been doing with uh, liquid crystal elastomer. You can use light and heat to trigger it to reversibly transform. OK, so I'll move on to the next project, paper. Uh, and uh, as you can see, we, I really love to use uh, cheap materials, better off the shelf. Um, and in this case, we're actually looking into paper. So we are 3D printing or 2D printing um, uh, composites of graphene and thermoplastic on top of a paper stripe. And uh, with that, you can start it to, yeah, this is video shows the printing process, super simple. It's a filament you directly can extrude out of a um, FDM printer, and then you can and uh, started to combine different paper units and designing interesting uh, and kin kinematic motions. And uh, because it's conductive, so you can also um, uh, build sensors uh, with it. The conventional stuff like touch sensing or slide sensing are very easy, basically human touch responses. But the last one is interesting, so the self-angle detection. So apparently if you heat up your actuator, the resistance of the actuator changes as well. So then you can leverage the change of the resistance to, uh, to detect how much the paper is bending. Uh, and then you can start from there designing more complex transformation behaviors by purely origami and kirigami. It's like a playground for, for my students. So they started to, you know, making things in stripes and talk about how you can tune the transformation of patterns and you can also develop kirigami uh, structure that can basically uh, lift itself up in, uh, in the z-axis and you can also think about the properties you can achieve once you uh, design patterns. This is elasticity and this we call it permeable ability because basically uh, you are opening up a hole with this structure uh, and uh, you can make some robots <laughs> but mostly toy robots and uh, it, uh, clients who are interested in working with us mostly come from the educational company uh, imagine you, you can design a pop-up book uh, that have the kinematic behaviors as long as you put a battery uh, on, onto it um, yeah, but uh, the interesting part is you can quickly prototype different kinds of uh, motion uh, very easily uh, on your own table almost. And uh, you can also uh, combine the sensing behavior into these paper robots. This one, it sensed uh, human touch, and uh, it's a mimosa. I don't know if people have heard of it. Basically, it's a natural plant that responds to human touch. We're just trying to make a synthetic version of it. And uh, industrial designers can also leverage this to design daily objects. You can have a lampshade that can tune its um, uh, lighting pattern on the fly as you are turning on the light. And this is actually one of my favorite. Um, you can also use doodle pen to print this actuator. It's poetic. Think about as little kids, we all like to draw things. But here you are drawing. But what you draw has kinematic function uh, in addition to the geometric uh, 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 visual effect as well. 
So my student uh, went to uh, uh, actually uh, went back to China and ran a workshop just a few months ago. Um, it was a workshop co-hosted by uh, Zhejiang University and Singapore um, Singapore Technology, yeah, SUTD, uh, short name for it. But so they basically worked with a, um, a group of designer who have some technical background, meaning operating some microcontrollers, and uh, the um, they started to envision how this paper can be leveraged to empower the design of books. So for, for graphic designer, you know, they like to think about colors and shapes and geometries when they design things with paper. But here we try to encourage them um, uh, to also integrate the animated behaviors or robotic behaviors into their graphic design. So you see some of the conventional, traditional Van Gogh paintings being animated. Um, and uh, I came from a, a research group called Tangible Media Group before I joined uh, CMU. Anything that has the uh, materiality and tangibility uh, really brought, uh, really touched my nerves. I think this was one of those efforts uh, that I really liked. So uh, this was a short summary to say we love to engineer morphing matter. Uh, and uh, in order to make material morph, so we actually need uh, some secret ingredients, so energy Stimuli, some sort of energy stimuli is one ingredient, and the composition, smart compositions of materials are another one. Uh, and uh, by by reflecting this, we we um, we actually figure this new uh, fun playground uh, to think about morphing matter. That's our kitchen. So if you think about when you are frying a big of uh, big bread, and as the thermal expansion is going on, you can you can control the shape. Or as you are cooking your dumpling, as the dumpling is floating on top of the water, uh, you can morph matter as well. Dumpling float because it expands its own body. So we thought there are a lot of uh, really fun physics and also ways of manipulating matter and ways you input energy in kitchen. So we started to look into uh, engineering of morphing matter for, for, for food. And um, um, that's why a group of um, uh, graduate students started to think about, um, think about uh, almost like robotic food. So uh, I started this research with a group of collaborators from MIT. And then uh, as I moved to CMU, we continued some of the work. So uh, scientifically, it's very interesting. So if you look at all the food ingredients. So the, 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 to some extent, they all swell, but they swell at different rate. Uh, and uh, everybody has experience with this. Basically, when you are cooking a piece of pasta, they grow fatter. Um, and that's the behavior we are looking into. But we are extract, extracting each individual edible components that have different swelling rate and recompose them for a composite material. So this case, if you make a thin film of a gelatin, gelatin is jello, you can get from supermarket, um, that have different, uh, different uh, density distribution across the section, you can have it prepared flat, but as you are cooking it, as you are putting it in water, it started to bend into a, a cylindrical shape. So this is just to uh, have some SEM, SEM image to show you guys the porosity of the film actually varies from the top to the bottom. Um, and uh, if you do something even fancier, in this case, it's a, it's a porosity varying gelatin film at the bottom and cellulose uh, parallel lines on top, you can have more sophisticated morphing behavior. Um, on the right hand side, it just shows uh, some light microscope image of how this film started to grow a uh, thicker and thicker within 80 seconds. So this is uh, again an um, animation we captured, mm, a video we captured from light microscope. You see the center part grows much slower than the edges because the edges are pure gelatin, which swells faster. But the center part is a composition of gelatin and cellulose, and we made it swell slower. Uh, and that was OK, not so fun. You can make a bending behavior. But once you started to think about new patterns you can, you can 3D print out of the cellulose, you can have more interesting programmable behavior. So in this case, a single flat disk can turn into a potato chips. By the way, it is actually uh, the principle of how potato chips work. You know, you chop potatoes flat, but once you fry it, it 
forms into a saddle shape. So there are a lot of commonalities in terms of the uh, ge geometric principles. And you can also fine tune the bending behaviors of a potato chip. But in this case, potato chip shaped gelatin pieces as well. Uh, and you can also transform a single disk into a flower if you started to print radial, radial symmetry pattern of the cellulose on top of the gelatin film. We developed a computational uh, fabrication pipeline to really fine tune the cellulose patterns we can print on top of the film. Um, and it turns out uh, it's quite controllable. You can also simulate this. Um, so this is really just to show um, it's a diffusion-based model. So as the water is penetrating through a flat piece of film, uh, by uh, varying the absorption rate of this this composite, you can get shapes that transformed into a controllable, into another controllable 3D shape. Um, and uh, more sophisticatedly, by tuning some of those mixing ratios, you can really control a sequential behavior. You can make a piece of film that bend horizontally first, then vertical second. I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but just to give you guys a bit of flavor. So there are really rich computational and robotic behaviors you can engineer just through the com compositions of material. There's nothing electronics. I'm not using a motor to trigger this actuator versus that actuator, but I can make things sequential in a sense. And you can also engineer a wide variety of shapes as well. So these shapes all come from flat, but they take on different 3D shapes. So this is a, this is a short video to show um, to show some of the shapes we were able to um, print. Yeah, so these are pasta being cooked in real time. So they all came flat, but as you cook them in water, they take on, they self fold into different 3D shapes. And uh, some looks like traditional pasta, but some are really hard to make. And uh, carry the IKEA spirit. They are all flat packed. Uh, and uh, we uh, got a chance to work with a chef in Boston. It's a French cuisine restaurant. We basically showed him our technique of making self-assembly food. And he introduced some new flavors. And this is a plankton helical uh, uh, substrate. And uh, um, this is a plankton flavored saddle shape. And this is just a single disc turned into a flower. It's mushroom flavored. And he was able to uh, engineer, I guess, innovate on top of his existing recipes and uh, make morphing food. Um. And especially for those fine dining restaurants, it's interesting because they have, you know, people go there to eat for three hours. We can really demonstrate some of those uh, morphing behaviors in front of their customer as they are serving. So this is one of my favorite. So it's a little film, a flat film, you dip it in water, um, and they, they're gonna wrap the caviar around it and form a little cannoli. So this video is played in real time. Uh, and the original idea was to make self-folding dumplings, but that was really hard. Uh, it turns out uh, Italian food are easier to engineer here. Um, and this is another very interesting behavior. It's a programmed self-disassembly behavior. So you have a long noodle if you cook it for a long, sh shorter time. But if you cook it for longer, so the noodles will chop itself into smaller pieces. Uh, so you can imagine you can cook for yourself who prefer longer noodles and for your kids who prefer shorter ones because it's easier to digest, all within one pot because the food itself can program its behavior to some extent. Um, so why we're interested in selling this idea of self-assembly self pasta because Italians are really crazy about the shapes of pasta because uh, shapes really carry special meanings and flavors and mouthfeel as you are pairing it with different sauce. And we did a calculation 
uh, and present this to Barilla Fox. Th that's one of the biggest uh, Italian pasta company in Milan, uh, and tell them we can save them 67.3 percent of packaging space if they make their all their macaroni, macaroni flat. And then they decided to uh, have an official contrast with CMU <laughs> and provided us some of those Italian grown semolina flour uh, to let us engineer real pasta that can transform. All the others I just showed you are fake because they are made of gelatin, right? But these, what I'm showing here, these are real pasta. And as you are cooking them, they can also take on different transformative shapes. So you can have a single line after boiling turn into uh, heli uh, you know, helical noodles. And you can also engineer different helix uh, or saddle or cylindro shapes for this case as well. So uh, intellectually, as a research project, we are super interested in either homogeneous or non-homogeneous materials and trying to engineer the transformative behavior and even think about the dynamic of energy that's going on. That's why actually we make a lot of good, great friends with, uh, with soft matter physics. Uh, but uh, application-wise, we just love to cre explore those creative applications on the side. So for example, these uh, uh, cookies, you can also, when you bake them, they can take on 3D shapes, and you can make even tacos that can self-wrap itself. Um, but this is a dehydration behavior instead of hydration. The energy dynamics of it is also really fun. And you can imagine those food can be used for different purposes. Of course, sell it in the market because it's so cool and have a lot of selling point. But we also think potentially you can ship those food much easily to disaster sites. Uh, mountain hikers can carry them much more easily, save space. But even in the future, maybe for space travel. Um, there were studies showing the astronauts really crave of having food, uh, like Earth-like food, when they are in space stations or when they are on space travels. So we thought if we save more space, maybe we can convince NASA to take those food instead of this super high energy complex, uh, compacted crackers. Um, that would be a, a fun project to follow up. So yeah, so I continue another project. Uh, I'm kind of trying to pick projects that really involve different material system. So for this project, we actually used living bacteria uh, as nano actuator. So this is a process of the uh, culturing. So uh, it's a bioreactor we, um, we borrowed from MIT chemical engineering department. So it turns out the specific bacteria we chose is called Bacillus subtilis uh, and uh, natto, natto family within Bacillus subtilis can grow really fast overnight. Uh, and uh, it can also actuate in response to the relative humidity in the environment. So it's an atomic force microscope imaging to quantify how much the cell can expand. The cell is uh, one tenth of your human hair diameter, so it's 10 micron. Uh, in a sense, it is sort of a nano actuator. It has a very high energy density as well. It's uh, supposed to be stronger than even ship memory alloy. But you know, still, it can't compete with SMA yet because they are individual. You still have to uh, bond them together. And we haven't go that far. But what we did is simply deposit those uh, uh, cells on top of a soft substrate to create this bilayer. And uh, you can then have all those um, structures created that can respond to relative humidity. So it's certainly, I don't really want it to make the selling point being the force of this actuator, um, but uh, it has a great sensitivity. So you see the video on, on the left up corner. So it is even the, the uh, even the little bit of a micro environmental changes on your skin can cause this uh, fabric to open and close. Um, so then we ended up uh, thinking the killer app could be a smart fabric. And this is basically a, um, a composite fabric we designed, partially supported by New Balance. Because uh, when I was a PhD student, I used to drive to New Balance. Uh, it was only half an hour away from uh, MIT campus. So this is uh, later on a follow up paper that we, uh, we wrote um, to talk about how you can uh, genetically modify the, the nano actuator bacteria we used to add in some other functionalities. So this actuator, for example, can glow as well as actuate. And both glowing and actuation are responsive to relative humidity changes. Now you can imagine you can design a shoe. Uh, and as you run in dark, it will glow more and more intensively as it will also open up the pores to help you to get rid of the sweat. Um, so these, again, they're just higher uh, <laughs> resolution images of the garment. 
and uh, I'm gonna share with you guys a little video. Um, and uh, this was uh, the, it was a collaboration with uh, two ballet dancers from Boston Ballet Company. Um, we wanted to show how this fabric can be responsive to the sweat. This is just to show how we parametrically design the sensors and actuator, uh, in this case, to address the most sweatier part of your body. So um, we figured it could be a really interesting artistic practice to uh, kind of think about the idea of a um, the idea of a symbiosis relationship between the wearer and also the bacteria that's being 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 weared. And I was was inspired by the dancers' comments. They said uh, once they felt like there are some living beings on the back, they started to think about different dancing dancing uh, dancing behavior, different different dance moves. So we ended up. Um, hosting them for a special exhibition we curated on campus. Again, so these are the bacteria films. So it was triggered by a robotic, <laughs> one access robotic steamer. So as you steam it out, so the, the, the film can open and close with some programmed uh, origami behavior. And then we also showed how we culture the bacteria and we had a wireframe sculpture, sculptor, uh, sculpture. So basically, the back of the sculpture are these uh, biohybrid films, uh, and they respond to steam as well. So we had a night event when we invited all the dancers over and dancing steam <laughs> because uh, the they, they apparently didn't sweat that much within uh, two minutes. Yeah, so we ended up shooting the steams. Uh, to them. Um, so, yeah, with all the projects, I think I wanted to bring you guys back to the page I showed at the very beginning. So we do believe natural morphing matter have the unique property of being responsive with electricity free energy. And uh, there is a very attractive uh, thing called material driven computation, which uh, we are looking into deeper and deeper. But how this is relevant to RI students. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's not so much robotic. If you go uh, geekier to think about our morphing matter is not so autonomous, it cannot learn. Um, and also it does not really have a rapid feedback loop between the sensing and actuation. There are sensing and actuation, but there are no dedicated computation to make your behavior m more sophisticated. So as the next step, especially after I joined CMU, um, I've been thinking a lot how to integrate more intelligent behaviors into those natural materials. Um, so that's uh, brought up to, uh, that really uh, led to a few collaborations that's currently going on with some of the CMU uh, professors who are more of the experts in, uh, in, in robot design in general. So one is uh, with uh, Professor Mohammed and Carmel Majidi. I believe Carmel is also part of RI. So we are looking into this uh, self-healing material that's both mechanically and electrically can heal. Um, and you can then think about designing a robot that you can cut in half. It struggles, but also it sense it's being cut. Uh, but then you can uh, join them back. It will self-heal, and then they can keep moving. So we're now designing more sophisticated uh, self-healing robots in a sense without uh, introducing any of those hard uh, electronic board. For now you can see they are still PCB boards but just connected with a piece of self-healing material. But the whole grand vision is to have this entire thing soft and every part of the body uh, self-healable. Mm, and uh, also you can sense 
precisely where it's being damaged. And also, again, with Carmel, we recently worked on a project that looks into stretchable fabrics as a robotic skin. And uh, our grand vision is to also integrate the actuation behavior through pneumatic actuation into those uh, soft, uh, soft sensors so you can have more like a robotic driven behaviors that, that can interact with your body and your skin. And we've already figured out a very interesting, well, simple actually, pipeline to m customize almost any sensing behaviors into the skin. So you can sense temperature, gesture, um, and uh, even the physiological signals. Um, and another very fun project, also a bit related to RI. So we've been looking into how we can use knitting machines to make uh, soft robots. So my student, uh, she uh, thought of how to combine the tendon displacement with the fancy algorithms that are being developed by Professor Jim McCann over RI, and uh, think about uh, arbitrary distribu di distributed tendon in, uh, in robotic knitted uh, skin, uh, and think about the actuation behaviors um, that are controlled. So, for example, you can make tendons that can have uh, really predefined um, actuation behaviors, or you can even need 3D objects um, also actuatable. Um, I guess I don't need to introduce the magic of Jim McCann, but basically all these things are manufactured really fast, way, way ma uh, more faster than our 3D printer. So the bunny was needed, uh, I guess it's within minutes, uh, sorry, within tens of minutes. 30 minutes, I think. Um, so we also actively try to collaborate with uh, people from different fields and really trying to sell this idea that uh, robotic uh, behaviors can go beyond just for robots design, but also you can bring robotic behaviors into your daily life. Furniture can be robots, uh, and uh, your dress can be robots. Um, and also trying to run, uh, actually I'm running a course in the coming semester, it's literally called M morphing matter, how you make shape-changing materials. So for folks who are interested, please uh, please uh, check your course selections. Um, and uh, so robotic morphing behavior is about robotic behaviors in our daily life. And I truly believe we need to really think uh, about the design of those things uh, uh, beyond just a single discipline. So it's uh, almost a combination of your experience and imagination uh, and perhaps your uh, interests and skill sets uh, in combination of art and science as well. So yeah, so with that, I want to end my talk, but with the extra slides, uh, Jim wants me to put this here. So Jim and I are co-chairing a conference in the summer in June. It's uh, called a Symposium for Computational Fabrication. So we are bringing students and professors from six different fields. Uh, uh, so like uh, human computer interaction, architect, robots, um, and material science and biology all coming together to talk about how computational software and hardware tools can empower better engineer uh, of the physical world in space. And uh, really amazing lines of speakers. You can totally just uh, you know jump in to talk for free, or if you have fancy, interesting demos you wanted to show, it's a great group of professors. I personally would love to interact with. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> three-dimensional mm -hmm. fiber reinforced soft materials. Uh, have you looked into whether uh, there are yarns or fibers that undergo similar transformations with either heat or twisting or uh, things like that? Yeah, so we Actually, I didn't put it here, but uh, in my lab, we have um, students working on the nylon actuator. So it was a science paper published uh, a few years ago, but they are trying to make uh, the nylon actuator, basically fish line based actuator, um, have rubber elastomeric coating, so you can have basically built-in restor restorative force to get it reversibly actuatable with electricity. That one is actually quite strong and extremely cheap, but cannot go on uh, Jim's knitting machine. So uh, in parallel, we've been talking to a material scientist over Japan to think about how we can engineer more of those uh, liquid crystal elastomer-based actuator. Those are actually quite knitable, can be engineered to be knitable. Yeah. Excellent. Other questions, thoughts? Yes. 
what's the maximum amount of force that can be actuated from a uh, robotic motion mat? Um, I showed many different kinds. Most of them are pretty weak. <laughs> and they are all very designed for a very particular purpose. But just the kind of the two I mentioned to Chris, uh, the fish line actuator and also the liquid crystal elastomer actuator, if you especially do it with some of this, um, you know, even carbon nanotube composite, they become particularly strong. Um, so I don't know. I think it's, it has to be application specific. But in general, they are... For a lot of things, they cannot compete with the motor. If you're trying to build a big robots that like go on assembly lines, you need specific purpose for it. For example, there's a startup out of uh, uh, Harvard, the George, uh, George Westside's group. So they do soft robots, but to pick up fragile objects, an egg or like a cookie. And for those cases, you want your robotic gripper to be very compliant and could potentially fit into different shapes. And that's where those weaker but more compliant uh, material driven robotic materials could play a role. But uh, I guess Chris is way more an expert in <laughs> making comments for where those uh, perhaps uh, more material driven uh, robotic materials could go. Well, let me just make a comment. The, the folks at the National Science Foundation interested in soft robotics are also inter interested in what I'll call irreversible actuation. And you should think of trees growing. They are essentially robots. Uh, they, plants destroy buildings. They can generate huge amounts of forces very slowly. And you know they can create very large structures. And if you're interested, for example, in building a building with robots, why not just have it grow? And you know there are plenty of plants that reversibly orient to light and things like that. But there are certainly many plants whose pattern of growth reflects the environment as well. And uh, you know, that, that at the National Science Foundation is just viewed as a certain kind of robot. Other questions, thoughts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you thought at all about like, paper airplanes that fly on their own? Like fly? Paper airplanes uh, that fly by it. We, s we just uh, brainstorming. Uh, we brainstormed very briefly how if you can uh, on the fly tune the shape and morphology of the wings or some tails of your airplane, you could have it uh, have a different direction, like a gear towards different direction. Maybe you can offload some of the control you, you do anyway with your um, motors and the hard components to the morphology of the airplane. But, so you yeah. could have a project of a glider that flies forever, always searching <laughs> for updraft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of the glider idea. There was a, this uh, SIGGRAPH work. We talk about glider, but uh, can fly for longer distance. We said, yeah, we can make it turn if you can morph some parts of it in the middle as it flies. <laughs> Other thoughts, questions? Mm. Yes. yes. Um, so I think, you know, this one, this specific kind of smart adaptive material uh, is really, um, I think it's being explored by people from very different fields. So there are greater chemists and material scientists really have been imagining the uh, different types of energy source, even the temperature fluctuation in space, or even the, you know, like UV light, visible light, sunlight could also be a harvest as source. I think we discussed the grand vision could be you engineer this genetic, uh, generic material that could be programmed to respond to different stimu stimuli with very specific transformation behavior. Like how you write your object-oriented code, you can basically plug in if this happens what behaviors you take as you take this then yeah basically you can ideally you have a compiler you can program the behaviors so now I would say just in terms of where the technology develops all the small small building blocks are there um, People are talking about how you draw a bigger picture to talk about materials that can compute in a more uh, almost a tuning complete manner. So, so we are also, as a group, very interested in that aspect. So there's an analogy, of course, to biology where uh, <coughs> you 
have a printer, mm. it's our protein synthesis mechanism, and it generates linear codes, and they fold up pretty much like your stuff, and that's what we're made out of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, the two, I said the biology for the symposium, symposium specifically, two of the speakers, one from Caltech, I believe, the other is an industrial uh, startup, they are all looking into how proteins and DNAs are folding. So, apparently, origami at DNA scale, at nano scale, is a big topic, and well, it's, it's pretty much like a computational topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, we... Yeah, we, um, we, we have thought a little bit how we can uh, borrow the idea of DNA and try to engineer larger scale objects more programmably, yeah. Other thoughts, questions, comments? Go ahead. I have a couple uh, questions. It's sort of related, it, um, such a thought provoking mm -hmm. uh, presentation that you gave to us and I really appreciate that. And I'm curious a little, it's sort of like a lot, writing alongside of all the things that you're talking about. Um, you, the um, electricity free and sustainable. So I'm, I'm curious about that element or how you all define sustainable. And then I'm really curious mm -hmm. too, and this might be for like the, everyone, that as one is developing, I, I don't come from uh, the engineering or robotics mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. But as one is developing these new technologies that might bridge over into the manufacturing world as the chair does or some of the other things. And um, I think about employment issues and sort of like the, the loss of need of different individuals to actually mm -hmm. do the manual labor as mm -hmm. things become more automated. And then just how, you know, we can see how that affects people in this region, right, when we lost certain kinds of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I'm just curious, what kind of discussions do people have about that, mm. part of it, as developing all of these new technologies as well? Yeah, uh, so both are very insightful questions and I don't have a good answer for. But for the first one, so you were asking the uh, sus my perception of being sustainable. Just wondering, there's so many different definitions. Yeah, yeah. Experience. So maybe a concrete example can better explain at least my perspective. So I think um, recyclable material and also less and less energy consumption, more of a really a symbiotic, symbiotic reaction and behavior. I think all part of saving energy, saving effort, that's being, uh, being uh, sustainable. For example, like the, the bacteria-driven garment. You can imagine, I guess for a lot of roboticists, they could imagine uh, equipped very um, precise sensors for each region of the body that would like to sweat and then maybe some ship member alloy or other actuator, and then maybe miniaturized microcontrollers to you know, get all the sweat data and then decide like a central computing system which scale to open for how much. So that's uh, one way to do it, uh, maybe with even higher controllability. But in our way, it's the material itself, the bacteria itself, is super sensitive to the degree of relative humidity and then open up just that much to let the sweat go out. Once the sweat goes out, it closes up back again. So there is a sensing actuation feedback loop, but everything are not consuming any energy. That's, I think, the, uh, the, yeah, the magic part of using material to do certain thing, but often very specifically carefully chosen scenarios. Um, I think that carries a bit of a sustainable, sustain, sustainable notion. And just in terms of, you know, you are saving materials uh, uh, because you don't need support when you print things flat and you're saving time, uh, right? You are saving shipping. So that also is being sustainable to me. Yeah, the second one, how our technology could uh, Say, um, put people out of jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do they create jobs or? <laughs> yeah, I always want, I want to say like a lazy, lame qu answer would be we are always talking about collaboration <laughs> with your tools and material, not we're getting people out of the loop. Uh, but it is kind of true. I keep saying, you know, with this, uh, I'm not an expert in machine learning at all, but we even that, we started looking into how we can make even more kind of accurate, precise simulation for exactly the reason. We wanted the tool to be easier and easier to use, and we wanted 
the designer who are using the tool to have um, like a real-time feedback um, because we really w want to empower designers to think about how to, how to design things that fulfill their needs. And also I showed you how we are, we are kind of leveraging the domain knowledge of a graphic designer to design books. Once we, ha we have that whole pipeline of designing paper with motion, graphic designer can bring their expertise to design books. Once we make food morph, chefs come in to design delicious food. We cannot do it. Once we have bacteria that morph, fashion designer could kick in to design a beautiful dress for a ballet dancer. So there are things I, I think rather than taking away their jobs is empower them to think about uh, creation, leveraging their expertise from a brand, brand new angle. Um, like the fashion designer who worked with us on the new, new, like the ballet dancer dress, she couldn't imagine herself getting a job from Nike <laughs> emerging technology department if she were perhaps not working with us. Before she was more about the culture, classic European fashion design style, uh, but then she is really thinking of her job from a new angle after working with us. I believe she agrees with me without her consensus here. <laughs> yeah. Other thoughts, questions? Every once in a while I get a call from the <laughs> press as to who will lose their job. <laughs> Origami artists. <laughs> Pasta designers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Other I think. Thoughts, questions, comments. All right. Well, I thought that talk was very <laughs> interesting, but also beautiful. Yeah. So <laughs> Thanks, thank you Chris. Very much. Yeah. <laughs>